going. So thank, thanks again uh, for everyone who uh, has joined today. And of course, thank you to Alicia and the Oregon uh, Jewish Museum and Center for Holocaust Education, um, who uh, behind the scenes as a team is helping to uh, not only run this amazing project, but uh, make today's webinar possible. Uh, so our session today, uh, lessons from the pandemic, challenges and successes in documenting oral histories in a virtual setting. Uh, really uh, honored, a pleasure to be supporting your, your work, um, uh, Alicia and, and uh, chatting with you today. And uh, I know you guys have done an amazing job of uh, recording over 200 oral histories in the past five months or so, which seems pretty wild. And uh, so we'll get into that. Um, but uh, I, I'm Zach Ellis, the founder and CEO of Their Story, uh, an oral history platform. Uh, and I'll let Alicia introduce herself before we uh, go through some housekeeping uh, items for the webinar. Uh, yeah, I'm Alicia Babstein and I'm the archivist out here uh, at the Oregon Jewish Museum and Center for Holocaust Education. And we are in Portland. Fantastic. Um, so today's webinar uh, will be made accessible in a couple places. So one will be on their story's aviary site. Uh, we'll also make the webinar uh, accessible, I believe, on Oregon Jewish Museum and Center for Holocaust Education site. Mm -hmm. uh, and we will be preserving the uh, webinar uh, at the very least on their stories uh, permanent.org uh, archive. Uh, highly recommend checking out uh, permanent as a fantastic preservation system. Uh, if you were on uh, their stories last webinar, uh, you'll know that I kind of framed things in a similar way. Uh, a book that has changed my life and uh, even impacts and helps inform how I approach uh, interviewing and, and preparing for an interview was Joseph Campbell's The Hero with a Thousand Faces. Um, but instead of uh, thinking about today as uh, you know, all of the uh, similar stories and journeys uh, that, uh, 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 that we're all on, uh, let's think about it as uh, the interviewers with a thousand faces. Uh, for anyone who is on today's session, uh, feel free to hop in, ask questions. Let's make sure that it is as useful for you as possible. Um, so definitely ask away and we will be addressing questions uh, as we go. Um, so the kind of general structure for our webinar, uh, again, following uh, the hero's journey, if you will, is uh, kind of a three act structure. We're gonna talk a little bit initially uh, about Kind of Alicia and OJM CHE's world before uh, the collection project that uh, they've been a part of with the Council of American Jewish Museums, the Collecting These Times project. Um, then we're going to talk about uh, kind of getting into the thick of it, the road of trials. Uh, what did it look like? What it, would it feel like? What was the experience like to operate uh, oral history uh, at scale? And Alicia will really dive deep into kind of the nuts and bolts of what the process looked like. And our hope is that you'll come away with some really actionable um, uh, things that you can use uh, for uh, building a base of, uh, of volunteer interviewers, building a base of interviewees in, in your community of narrators in your community um, and, uh, uh, and get some real tactical ways to, to approach that. And then we'll talk about kind of what are some lessons learned uh, from doing this over the past five, uh, six months uh, or so and what, what does the future look like? So uh, a couple housekeeping things. Um, if you have questions, uh, please throw them into the Q&A field. Uh, of course, we love comments as well. Anything that you want to uh, uh, say or ask, um, feel free to throw the comments in the chat, but we'll be monitoring uh, both the OJM CHE team uh, will be taking a look and keeping us updated as questions and comments uh, come along. So with that, off we go. Uh, and I'm going to stop sharing my screen and we'll spend a lot of time kind of in the conversation and then Alicia uh, will share her screen uh, as we talk about the uh, process. So Alicia, to kick things off, uh, why don't you just start by telling us a little bit about yourself? Uh, yeah, so like I said, um, I'm the archivist here at the Oregon Jewish Museum and Center for Holocaust Education. Um, we're a small team, small organization, uh, so there are a few of us that kind of fall under that Jane of all trades category. Um, 
in my capacity as archivist, I do work closely with our collection and our volunteers and our interns. Um, I work with our exhibitions program, primarily in project management. Um, I do help with installations when that needs to happen. Um, I work with, on a daily basis with our core oral history project. Uh, so that includes conducting the interviews, transcribing, editing, um, especially editing the audio, getting everything ready to go up on the website um, and then uploading all of that to the website. Um, also coordinate all of the interns and volunteers who work with that project. They also conduct, um, edit, transcribe, write the bios and abstracts that go up on the website and in the database. They also will help me find um, and identify photographs that I wanna include with the web, uh, excuse me, the interviews as I put them up on the website. Um, I also work with our general intern and volunteer program within the collection. So those are the folks that come in and, you know, process, scan photographs, catalog photographs and other parts of the collection. Um, most of our interns are student interns ranging from undergrad seniors to graduate students. And I think our oldest volunteer right now is about 92. Um, and most of them have been coming for years. Um, and I also do quite a bit of our IT in-house. Uh, quite a lot. And that is uh, incredible. What, what got you into the world of archiving and cultural heritage uh, work out of curiosity? Yeah. Uh, probably pretty similar to some other folks on the call. Um, you know, I'm a history buff and really had an interest in preserving um, history. I really, I mean, I sort of decided to go into library science. Uh, I suppose it's a little cliche, but I mean, I always loved being in a library. I loved my librarians in school. Um, I could just spend all day around books. Uh, and um, I really, I sort of, I majored in biology, women's and gender studies in college and, you know, sort of decided where I wanted to go after that. And I, I landed in, a, um, in the MLIS program and it was fantastic. Um, I do, you know, I also, I think that it, like I ended up at the, the museum specifically um, when you're in school, it's a little hard to decide exactly what you want to do if you didn't know going in. And, you know, I, I had the opportunity to work in a city, um, a government archive, and that was great. I also worked in an academic archive and that was great. But um, I really found the most joy in working with community archives um, and the folks who really build that archive. Uh, so that's sort of what brought me to the museum and to the field. Fantastic. And uh, tell us a little bit, you, know, you mentioned that that's kind of what led you to uh, to the Oregon Jewish Museum. Tell us a little bit about the, the museum. Yeah, so we um, house the, we, it is our job to preserve the, um, the Oregon Jewish experience here. Uh, so, you know, we spend, um, the, the majority of our work is in presenting exhibits and collection material to the, the community and, and abroad uh, in terms of the um, Oregon Jewish history. We have an enormous education program. Uh, we're a small team, but our education team, they're three, but they, um, they reach far and wide and they do, you know, we have student groups that come in uh, when we were in-house and we had exhibits in-house. Sometimes we'd have 400 students through the week, uh, which was a lot and the education team takes care of all of that. We have um, uh, rotating exhibits in our core, uh, or excuse me, in our main gallery downstairs and a smaller gallery downstairs as well. Um, those come from all over the world. And then we have core exhibits upstairs, which um, tell the story of the Jewish experience here in Oregon from the earliest days, the, the mid 1800s. Um, we have a core exhibit um, regarding the Holocaust. And then we also have a discrimination in Oregon primer, um, which is a pretty fantastic exhibit. Um, that's us. Yeah. And, and now you have also had kind of an established oral history program coming into uh, you know, this time uh, during the pandemic. You already had some of the infrastructure. Tell us a little bit about um, why that is, you know, what, what role has oral history played for the Oregon Jewish Museum and, and why is it important to you and, and to the, the work of the museum? Yeah, so we do have an infrastructure in place, yeah. Um, you know, at the most basic level, I'd say oral histories are important because there's so much that you can learn from a two hour conversation about somebody's life. You know, the things that you can learn about them and the community that they grew up in and the community that they live in. Um, short of journals and memoirs and correspondence, maybe um, it's really the best source of information about a person's life and then also about the community. Um, and I really, really value the connection that it gives to us and our um, community here. You know, I think that, um, people really like to tell their story. They really like to share their history. It means a lot to them and it means a lot to us to build that relationship. And it's really one of the parts um, of being a community archivist that I think is, is one of my favorite uh, because 
our collection depends on those relationships. We don't have a collection without those relationships. So um, building those relationships through oral history is, is really invaluable. Um, and that community history is just hard to get without those oral histories. We, you can read all kinds of stuff. You can absolutely learn about a community without oral history, but um, to hear people tell their stories and really relate what it was like to walk down a street with all the businesses or see their friends at school or how the community changed um, is really, I just, I don't see um, an easier way to get that kind of information or a better way to get that information than in oral histories. Um, our project spans six decades um, and all walks of life in the Jewish, of the Jewish community here in Oregon. Um, our first interview was conducted in 1969 and we've changed the format over the years and we've changed a couple of practices, but our core focus is still there. It's our job to preserve um, and share the, the stories of the Jewish community in Oregon. And, um, and so um, collecting it that way is really priceless for us, so. Yeah, yeah. And so it's, it's kind of, it sounds like been a, a core aspect of what you've been doing for, for a long time and a focus on the relationships. It's, uh, it's an opportunity to build relationships too. So what, how do people um, hear about uh, the oral histories? Uh, how, how do you promote the program? Um, how have you done that to date before we got into kind of the, uh, the project with, uh, with Cajun? And, and, and what have been some of the, the main challenges before uh, uh, this point uh, uh, in time? Yeah, so um, beyond what's up on our website, I have about 230 interviews up there currently, um, and we do have a great description of the project there. A lot of it is word of mouth. Um, we do, you know, we do presentations uh, frequently with our community, just we dive into the oral history project and, and we share clips and photographs and stories and sort of, um, you know, give a little bit of a history of some part of the community through those oral histories. When we talk to organizations or families, when we're asking for their material, um, you know, we do mention the oral history project and that we would love to interview anybody who's willing. So the, the us talking about it constantly with our group, um, our community and, and um, other people sharing the project is really, I think the, the best way that people can find our, um, our collection. And we are the only organ, we're, we're the only Jewish museum here in Oregon. So we're also sort of a natural go-to for folks when they are um, looking for some, for something, whether it's research or genealogy family. And so they come to us. Um, and then your next question was about what's challenges in main, or yeah, maintaining that. that, that yeah, part. yeah. And even before uh, the Collecting These Times initiative, um, what have been some of the, you know, I think you've, you've said before that there's about 800 oral histories. I mean, uh, even before the pandemic hit, um, kind of what, what were some of the main challenges uh, in operating the program? Yeah, so uh, I mean, there are a couple, but I'd say the primary challenge is recruiting and keeping volunteers. Um, and that continues to be a challenge. It was a challenge before and it, and it still is regardless of COVID um, for the core project. Uh, so we, you know, we depend on our volunteer community to conduct and transcribe these, these interviews. Uh, there are only two of us on staff who work with the, the project otherwise, and we don't have time to do all of it, of course. And a um, lot of folks are interested in participating in all kinds of ways, but it's a time commitment. And even our retired community members have busy schedules, you know, so it, that's, that's a major challenge. Um, at this point, I'd say we have roughly 90% of our oral histories transcribed, uh, which is pretty huge. Yeah, we've been whittling away at that list for years and years. Um, and of course, the hurdle after that is editing those transcripts. So uh, we don't take anything, we don't edit content. We don't take anything out that anybody says is part of their core story. What we do um, take out our full starts, all of the ums, the yas, uh, the uhs, and try to make sure that it reads smoothly with the audio. And that takes just as much time, if not longer, uh, than the transcription piece. And we have just a couple people who help with that part of the project. And then all of the other pieces, getting the biographies and abstracts written, which is um, a skill in itself. It's not, it's, it, it, you have to read the whole interview to really, you know, get a sense of the person if we don't have other stuff related to them in the collection that you can draw from and the abstract for what the interview is actually about. So it takes time and it takes, it takes practice. Um, so those are two of the real, the biggest hurdles is really keeping the, you know, getting volunteers involved and, and keeping them on board uh, and then actually working through the material. Yeah, yeah, totally. And so, Talk about pandemic hit. What what were your first uh, kind of reactions or, or steps to conducting uh, oral histories during during the pandemic? <laughs> yeah. So obviously we had no idea that um, we'd be in this sort of remote work environment for um, as long as we have been. Um, 
and that said, then we had no intention of changing our methods um, for the way that we conducted oral histories. I think that we probably would have been content to simply put collection on hold for a time if we were really just going to be shut down for a couple of months. Um, but sooner rather than later, we realized that we were going to be in this for a long time. Uh, and so we did have a few people who were already lined up to, uh, on the interview queue. They, you know, like they, we didn't have dates scheduled, but they, we'd already started that conversation. So we went ahead and um, conducted those interviews using Zoom, which was um, very easy. You know, it's, it's an easy platform to use um, and it just saves to the cloud or computer and, and that worked well. Uh, it's, there's a, a, the challenge with that is most of our participants, they were fine uh, because COVID had come and everyone had been using Zoom for some time. Uh, being recorded on video, but most of all, all of our interviews are done um, audio only. So, you know, that was a bit of a, a hurdle for a few folks who decided not to participate. Um, but even using Zoom and as handy as it was, we weren't really planning to head out and just start conducting dozens of oral histories that way. Um, we like our current practices and we didn't really want to overhaul anything and we had plenty on our plates. So that wasn't a, a huge priority for us. Um, and we had talked about the idea of capturing um, the moment, you know, trying to collect stories of the, the pandemic and what COVID meant for people in our community. We started by dedicating um, one of our phone lines uh, to uh, the extension um, for people to call in and leave two or three minutes, you know, an anecdote about a COVID experience, um, but it wasn't terribly successful. I think that it was having to do it on your own, you know, you had to make the time, make the phone call, make sure you got the right extension. Um, and then you were just talking to nobody. You needed to share a story. You had to come up with it. It's, I think it's a little easier when you're prompted. Um, and we, we did send out a couple of prompts in terms, like in an e-blast, but it, the, the response wasn't huge. Um, and then what ended up happening, uh, KJM, the Council of American Jewish Museums, like you mentioned, um, put out a call to member institutions uh, asking if we would like to participate in a nationwide project chronicling, chronicling COVID, um, where we collect stories from our local or regional Jewish communities um, about our experiences during the pandemic, as well as experiences with the social struggles um, of 2020, the campaign and election year, um, eventually the wildfires here in Oregon, and now, of course, the vaccine. Um, and we responded, uh, obviously, super excited to participate in that project under their auspices. Fantastic. Well, I'll uh, in just a second kind of ask about kind of what that looked like in, in getting started. I do, I do see a quick question from Jenny Matz um, around the tran transcription uh, editing that you had mentioned. Do you correct factual inaccuracies or leave an editor's note or how, how do you um, approach that? Yeah, we leave an editor's note in brackets. So if someone mentions um, a year that uh, an event happened, those are the easiest uh, for us to correct uh, without going back to a person. If they get a birthday wrong or a, something like that, we may not know unless they let us know that that's the case. Um, and we do send all of the transcripts to the narrators so that they can go through and make sure that we've spelled all the names correctly that they've mentioned. Um, and that if there are any, uh, inaccuracies that they can help have us correct that. But if say someone said uh, the year that the war started um, and it's incorrect, then we leave it because they said it and the audio matches that. But then in, in editor uh, note in brackets, we just make sure that we know that the, the date is correct, uh, that we correct the date. And we do that for all kinds of things. Um, yes, that's how we do that. Got it, fantastic. So uh, uh, leaving the, in, in editor's notes. So let's, uh, let's dive in a little bit to Kind of what the process was like once you got started with the collecting these times initiative getting started with their story talk about what those first steps look like for um amassing a, a, a network of volunteers and, and interviewers uh talk us through um how you did that and, and how you managed uh the team and process yeah so uh first steps really um I met with uh, my two colleagues, so the director of the museum and the curator of the collection. Um, she's the other one who works on the oral history project with me most of the time. Um, and we talked about what we wanted to collect in terms of contact content. Like what was what were we after? Um, K. Jum, when they signed us all up, you know, they had their their uh, sort of some sample questions that they suggested we ask, and so we worked with that and sort of came up with um, questions that were specific to our community here. Uh, and we also talked about how many of those stories we thought we could collect. Um, I think I threw out about 50. Uh, I thought that that was ambitious. Um, 
with everything else on our plates, especially since I was going to be managing the project. Um, I think one of them said 75, one said 100, maybe 150. And so we went ahead and went big. We, we aimed for 150 um, and we would have been happy with any number that we collected, I think. But we, you know, we were really hoping for, hoping for the moon, <laughs> as it were. Um, and we, uh, Cajun brought us on, I think we had a chance to start thinking about the project back in June. Um, I think our first training as at, with institutions, uh, the, the nine or 10 of us participating with USAC were, was July. Um, and so then, uh, you know, I went through, um, we made a list in house. Uh, so that would be Judy and Ann and I speaking about who we thought we wanted to interview. Um, and we sort of gleaned that list, um, from, uh, member, uh, membership, volunteers, interns, uh, family, friends. And we started with the list of who we thought might be willing to interview. Um, and we reached out to them and I had quite a few of them that were interested, not quite sure they wanted to participate. They really needed to know a little bit more about the project and time frame and expectations. Um, but uh, so then we sent out, once we had our list compiled in house, um, we sent out an e-blast uh, to ask for people who would be willing to participate as interviewees or interviewers. Um, and the response was huge. Uh, I think all of us were a little surprised, um, not terribly, but a little. <laughs> um, as it turned, I mean, I was worried I was gonna have to start turning people away um, as interviewers, not interviewees, but um, I think between Portland and Eugene, so Eugene is a couple hours south of us. It's another big town here in Portland where we have a lot of volunteers that work with us. Um, I think we had 40 interviewers who originally signed up, which was a large number. Um, and by the time my first training was underway, I think I had 37 and then a couple other people stepped away for, uh, because of other life uh, obligations. And so by the time we actually started the project I had 35 interviewers who were, and I was one of them, of course, but so there were 35 of us who are participating in the project. Um, and a lot of them, just like us, had work schedules and other commitments. So I knew that they'd only be conducting a few interviews, um, but they still wanted to participate and I wanted their participation. Um, and I wasn't planning to do that many interviews at the beginning uh, because I was managing the project and I had other tasks on my plate. I think I've done 38 now, which is pretty great. Um, we also had a huge response in terms of people who wanted to be interviewed. Uh, so we made, like I said, we made that list internally um, and we expected to write a number of personal emails and maybe group emails, which only differ from an e-blast because we were gonna target those emails to like write something specific to clergy, write something specific to the business owners we knew in town. Um, and we didn't really have to do that <laughs> after the e-blast got sent out. Um, it, I, I think within two days, I had at least 90 people uh, who had who had volunteered just to be interviewed. And that was fabulous. Um, and something remarkable about that was that maybe a quarter of them, maybe a little less, were folks who were already on the list that we'd identified in-house. So that meant that a lot of the folks um, were people we hadn't thought of yet, uh, which was really great. And we knew a lot of them who were volunteering to be interviewed, but we didn't know all of them. Some of them were members and some weren't. Um, if they got the e-blast, they were probably members. And if they didn't, they had the e-blast forwarded to them, or maybe they saw it on a Facebook group and they just kept emailing and emailing. Um, and we're nearing the end of the project here. And I think, <clears throat> again, some folks have stepped away even as interviewees uh, because of other, other commitments or, or other things that have come up for them as the year has gone on. Um, but I think all told, I had about 277 people who were on that list to be interviewed or that we have interviewed. Um, and we have 223 done um, to date. And I, like I said, I've done 38. My colleague Anne has done 27 and all the rest have been done by our volunteers, which is really uh, pretty amazing. And, you know, we hit that, we started to get pretty close to that 150 mark much sooner than I thought we would. Um, and I thought, okay, I'm going to be thrilled if we get 175. That's going to be amazing. And then two weeks later, I think we had 174. <laughs> so uh, we started shooting for 200 and we almost had 200 by the end of 2020. The holidays made it a little tough to schedule. So we didn't hit 200 until about the first week of January. But yeah, now we're up to 223. That's absolutely uh, incredible. And uh, I'm curious if maybe you could show a little bit of what it looks like, um, kind of the, the tool that was used for um, kind of facilitating recordings, transcription, and then what your process actually looked like, what those emails looked like, what, what did the outreach look like? How'd you manage it? 
Yeah, absolutely. Um, help me here, Zach. Can you see my screen okay? I can see your screen, yes. Perfect. Hopefully that means everyone else can too. I know, <laughs> you're so ping. Um, someone will probably send us a comment if they can't. Um, so the, the platform, um, I won't walk through the whole thing uh, because two video applications open at one time, at least on my computer is a little bit slow. Um, but essentially um, launching the session is just as easy as launching a session in Zoom. You just set it up and send a link. It's so easy. Um, and uh, something that I appreciate about their story is that it is, it's web-based. There's no applications to download. Nobody needs to, um, just not another thing you need to put on your phone or your computer, which is really helpful, especially for certain um, generations, of course. Um, and when you get through, you wanted me to like kind of just show this page, yeah, Zach, and then walk yeah. through some of the other pieces. Um, yeah. So uh, conducting the, the, the interview, it's again, just like Zoom, you just record it and it pops up here. There's a, um, you get to enter all of this information, the title, um, the description, who's participating um, and tags, all that kind of stuff. And it just, it's all in one place. It all just lives on one page, um, which is really handy, which I think we might talk about a little bit later, sort of like why other other parts of, of their story that I think are so fantastic. But um, I can also share, uh, so yeah, in terms of sending out that e-blast, like this is this is the language that we used. Um, I have all of this here to share with you. I, I know it's, it's a little funny just to read while we're all talking, but um, I have them here. And partly because um, if anyone would like me to send this to them after, if they're trying to, you know, start this sort of a project, I'm more than happy to share. It's nothing, it's not rocket science. Um, they're ju it's just, it was the easiest way to communicate with my team. There were so many of them and with other stuff on the plate, it just, it just made it so much easier to create these sort of processes. Um, so before I go on, Zach, I want to make sure that I'm actually answering your question. So can you just repeat it or, or ask me? Yeah. Yeah, no, this is definitely where I think uh, we will want to go. Um, uh, real quick, though, I think it could be interesting. We have a couple questions on the transcription side of things. One, maybe to show what that looks like in their story, but two, uh, Melissa has a question here, um, which is, do you rely solely on volunteers for transcription? Do you ever outsource this work to companies like Rev.com? If not, is it for quality control, such ethical concerns, financial reasons? So talk a little bit about that and, and maybe if you want to show the, uh, what transcription looks like through, through their story. Yeah, I'll show transcription through their story. And I'll also just talk a little bit about um, us in house, all of our transcription is done uh, by volunteers. Uh, and the primary reason for that is, is, it is financial. Um, it those those services cost money and they're not, they can be a little faster, but it's not quite worth it. We have such a um, active group of volunteers. The hardest volunteers to keep, like I mentioned before, are usually the ones conducting. We do have a pretty helpful um, group who have done all of our transcription. And of course, now that I, like I said, so much of it's already done, we don't need as many volunteers who are continuing that transcription process, but we just use um, an MP3 file. We drop it into ExpressScribe, which is a free software. I can send the link to that um, in the chat at the end, but um, it's super handy. Uh, and so it's free also. So the whole process for us is free if we can use free software and volunteers who are willing to help. Um, so we don't, we don't send it out and it's not, it isn't necessarily because of ethical concerns. We would simply include that in our waiver that folks knew that it was gonna be sent out to somebody to, to transcribe. But um, yes, so our transcription process in-house for core project is Word and Expressscribe. And then in their story, um, this one already says edit transcript because I've already transcribed it. But if you go down, you can see um, there's a button that just says auto transcribe. It takes, um, it's not, it's not real time. So this won't take 35 minutes to transcribe. It's somewhere between 12 and 18 minutes. Usually I think when I've timed it, um, and then the transcript comes, uh, it's here and you can edit the transcript in this window. Um, I usually, uh, because I, the way that our process is working currently, so I will export it and download it as a word document. And then, um, I send it to one of my transcribers, um, who will, uh, make sure that it's all reading correctly. So um, for example, uh, all of the interviews that I've done, it gets my last name. My last name is Bab Stein and it, it transcribes me as Bob Stein, uh, two names. Um, one of my volunteers actually addresses me exclusively as Bob now, which is pretty funny um, just because it's a running joke. But um, we, 
so it makes mistakes um, and um, with with certain words, terms, um, it doesn't, if we're speaking quickly, it sometimes um, inverts the, the words. So there's a lot of um, cleanup that needs to happen at times, at least in our experience so far. Um, but it's, it's a little bit faster to have um, their story auto transcribe these and then send it to my transcribers who then, you know, do that double checking. And then it still goes through the other editing process where we're making sure that, um, that the, the, all of the pieces have been caught that, that um, follow our style guide in house. Uh, so that's the transcription piece. Yeah. Fantastic. Yeah. And I'll, I'll make uh, one plug real quick here. Uh, Alicia, if you click on that, uh, that, arrow the, the first button on the top right. Um, so just to show that you can export in, in different formats, whether it's text or Word documents. And also uh, we export in a format specifically that um, is uh, compatible with ohms. If you use uh, Doug Boyd or the, the Nun Center's uh, ohms open source software for indexing or, or transcript al uh, alignment, um, uh, you can directly export a Word document that you can upload right to OMS and it'll have the 30 second time intervals. Um, and you can also export, if you click on the button just below that, uh, Alicia, real quick, um, you can export as closed caption formats as, uh, as well. Um, so a lot of versatility in, in our ideas, anything you put into their story, you can get out uh, to make sure that it works with whatever workflow um, uh, that, that you have. Um, but also being able to have the transcript here that is time aligned, connected to the media, uh, that it has been helpful for some folks as well. Um, let's hop over back to the, the language uh, side of things or, or how you have managed the process with um, your network of, of volunteers, uh, recruiting them, managing, what, what does that all look like? And, and especially because we have, one, we'll share these documents uh, with anyone who, uh, who would like, um, but so that's on the recording, maybe if also if you scroll down, Alicia, to show the full document so people can go back and, and see it too that way. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so this was the this is the e-blast that we sent out, um, short and sweet. Uh, and we dedicated the e-blast to this. So we didn't, a lot of times we send out e-blasts, you know, for events coming up and there are a few things listed. We dedicated one just to this project, which was helpful. Um, and then in terms of managing the project, um, you know, I, I, I am, <laughs> I'm a systems person, but I, I like to make those systems as simple as possible. And I use the simplest, uh, the, the most basic tools that are available to me because there's no reason to complicate it. Um, and so for me, um, I, it was a little challenging. I, I, when those emails first started to come in, I, I responded to one and I'd come back to my inbox and there were three or five more. It wasn't going to be, it wasn't possible for me to keep up with the number of people that were responding. So I had to give it a day or two and really let those, e those, um, those responses slow down a little bit before I started responding. And so in that, that time, when I realized most people who were responding were saying, oh my gosh, great project. I'm so excited to participate. Count me in. Uh, maybe they gave me some details about stuff that had happened over 2020 to them. Um, but it was just people who wanted to participate. So what I did was I just created these very basic um, like responses, these temp, I just call them templates, but it was just, you know, every single person, if, if Joe, John, David, Sarah, Annie, everyone who responded, I just put their name there. And then this just copy and pasted this in. And it was the same for everything. It made it very easy to respond to everybody. Um, if they, a lot of them asked specific questions and I would answer those um, separately. Absolutely. Um, and it was important to me to respond to everybody um, who emailed because I wanted them to know that they were on my radar. Um, I appreciated that they wanted to participate. Um, and I also wanted to give them a timeline, you know, it was going to be some time just before I even had interviewee interviewers trained to get the whole project up and running. So I wanted them to know that um, there would be a lag. Uh, and then the same for interview, uh, this was interviewers, excuse me, and then interviewees, uh, same thing, just, you know, um, all pretty basic uh, information, just letting them know that I had registered their email. And then I did have quite a few people who were interested in doing both. They wanted to both be interviewed and do some interviewing. So I had a response for them as well. And I did ask them, um, you know, to go ahead and, and let me know, because some people just said, I'm happy to participate. That was their response. I didn't know if they wanted to be interviewers or interviewees. Um, and so I sent them this email as well. And I just, with a PS said, you know, if there's one, if you'd like to participate on one side specifically, please just let me know. Um, and then just went from there. Um, we did have, uh, 
once I had all of these people lined up um, to be both uh, interviewees and interviewers, the next steps, of course, were going to be training the interviewers. Um, and so I sent out um, an email uh, and I just wrote this so that I could, I sent it out. Um, this was a group email. I just BCC'd everybody. Uh, so all 40 people at the beginning or 37, I guess, by the time I started the trainings, I just sent this out to everybody. Um, so this wasn't a template so much as I just wanted you all to, to have it if you wanted the language. Um, and then I just listed, this was all an email. Uh, I didn't want to have documents attached that people had to like download and send back and fill in. So um, I just included this in the email, which you could then just type into, which was easy. So I just gave them four days and four times um, and just ask them to say yes or no. Uh, and everyone got back to me in a pretty reasonable amount of time, um, which was handy. Um, and then I um, just made them, I made a list of everybody uh, that was participating and the days and just put a check next to when they could or couldn't participate so that I could get everybody on a, on a schedule. Um, it looked bigger than I had to print it out <laughs> and I had to print out a couple different parts of the list because I needed to be able to cross reference, which is easier for me to do in paper than um, on the computer. And then just had them on a schedule. I didn't want more than five, six at most on a day. Some I, I Occasionally I had a couple more because they needed to jump out of a time and move into another because of a, an engagement that came up. So um, rather than hold a whole separate time and try to like fit people in um, or do one off trainings, I just fit them into one of these groups. Um, and that worked out quite well. Um, and then, so the trainings were interesting. Uh, the training process was, all done via Zoom, everything was remote. Um, and so most of everyone, Zoom worked great for everybody. That wasn't a problem, fortunately. And all I did was share the screen uh, and walk them through step-by-step step, uh, how the, the tech part of the whole project was gonna work. So, um, uh, you know, how to launch the session, how to create an account and get logged in, uh, launch the session, record the session, get to the, the metadata page, the, the sort of finish page where they can enter that title and the names of the participants um, and saving it, which was a really important step, of course. Um, I, reiter I reiterated that a hundred times to every single person in that training because I really didn't want these discarded on accident. Um, and I created a PowerPoint with slides and screenshots for everybody and then a Word doc with the checklist. I don't have that here, um, but I can send that to folks too. It was sort of just a, some people like the visual and some people like just a list. So I wanted them to have the ability to, to check themselves at every step as they, they launched their first two or three sessions until they really got the hang of it. Um, and after each training session, I set up a practice, uh, like a practice run through with each and every one of them that I did. Uh, so I had them launch a session and invite me to it and make sure that everything worked well. Didn't take long for most of them. Um, those sessions were really helpful for several reasons. Quite a few people ended up with some glitches, uh, whether they were audio or video or, you know, their browser wasn't working correctly. So sort of troubleshooting that on the front end, as opposed to when they were beginning uh, an actual interview was really helpful. They still had some of those issues. It also like helped, I just kept notes, you know, so so-and-so wasn't able to, um, hear me the first time. It took us a little bit to get her microphone working. Then I made a note of that so that when she had her first interview on the calendar, I could make sure that if that happened again, these were the steps that we went through to make it work. Um, and then I also had a few of them who had never conducted an interview before and were nervous about the process, just talking to somebody they didn't know. I had them conduct a mock interview with either me or my colleague, Anne, um, uh, because we've done so many interviews and, and transcribed so many. It was, you know, we can kind of walk them through that process. And that was a huge challenge in itself um, to not only train people on this technology that none of us had ever used, including me, um, and for many of them that the this whole video computer technology was new anyways. You know, most of us hadn't used Zoom before COVID. We hadn't had a reason. Um, and also to train them to conduct an oral history, uh, an interview was not impossible remotely, just a little, just challenging in a different way. Um, not being able to, to, I don't know, walk them through that. Usually they shadow, you, you know, like then we shadow them while they're doing an interview and it's hard to do that remotely. So it ended up working out um, just fine. Um, and then I'm just gonna keep talking. So interrupt me at any point, Zach, I'll just keep walking through these. Uh, but then, uh, so then in terms of 
once I had the list of people who were going to be do, conducting the interviews and then all the people who were going to be interviewed, um, I just started pairing them up down, down the line. Uh, and I did it uh, by order of when they signed up. I didn't, it didn't make sense to do it alphabetically, especially because I expected people to be added to that list as it went on. So it would jump all over the place. And it seemed like the fairest way to do it. You know, somebody responded and I didn't want them to be jumped down to the bottom of the list just because their name ended in Z or started in Z, excuse me. Um, and so as I started pairing people up, um, those training sessions and mock interviews and everything were also very helpful. Um, I did end up knowing quite a few people on the list of people who volunteered to be interviewed. Uh, and so getting a feel for how somebody's, somebody's comfort level with technology and the whole process was helpful in pairing them up. So I did jump around um, a couple times in terms of, uh, you know, so this person was next on the list, but I, I connected the next available um, interviewer with maybe the third person down on the list because the pairing made more sense. Or I did have people who volunteered as interviewers and they suggested people that we should interview. And if they agreed, then they asked if they could do their interview. So sometimes they were way down on the list, but um, it was really important to me that this process be uh, enjoyable and fun for my uh, volunteers. This was they're volunteering to help us with this project. So I didn't want it to feel like work or an obligation um, in any way. And that's all relative, obviously. Um, everybody manages their schedules differently and technology can be challenging, but um, I wanted to make it as smooth and fun as I could for everybody. Um, and then I created this, is just, I sent this out. I've used this, this literally all of these same words now um, in every single introduction that I've made between an interviewee and an interviewer. Um, and it's just, you know, putting in, just changing out these X's for names. What I ended up doing is every single time I introduced Anne to somebody, you know, I would just go to my sent folder and pull out that one and just change out the name of the participant. It was perfectly easy for me to do that. But this was the easiest way. It has all the information that they need. Um, it's, it wasn't, it's a lot of information. I don't really think it's overkill, but I just wanted to make sure everybody got the same language. And it didn't mean that I had to write a, a new email every single time. Copying and pasting this made those responses or those introductions take five seconds instead of however long to type this all out. Um, and I did attach a waiver. I don't have that here for, for you all to see, but I, again, I'm happy to share our waiver language. It's pretty standard. Um, and I just attached it, asked them to fill it out. Um, and then I always included my cell phone number uh, so that both participants had it. Um, and everybody has used it many times. Um, I get calls all the time. Um, I've had, I have so many more contacts in my phone now because I wanted to make sure if somebody was calling, I didn't deny it because I thought it was spam um, and they were desperate for help in an interview. And then I also sent out this language to um, interviewers to get in touch with their interviewee the first time. Uh, and so uh, what some of them expressed to me um, was nervousness about getting in touch with someone they might not know. Even though I'd made that initial introduction, it still felt a little bit like a cold call for some people. So I created this language um, and just sent it to them. And I, you know, I just said, this is some language you can use if you'd like to. Um, and please, by all means, modify it however you see fit um, as you're getting in touch with this person. And everybody, the first couple of times they responded to someone, they usually CC'd me and they used this language in some format. Um, and eventually they stopped CCing me once they got comfortable. And so um, I don't know if they, I don't, I doubt they continue to use exactly this language, but um, I think that a lot of them felt it pretty, found it pretty helpful. Um, and it was easy again to, to make and just send out to everybody. Um, and I really encouraged all my interviewers to include their cell phone number if they were comfortable with it, because what happened in several cases was um, they would connect, the, they would be able to send the link, the interviewee would get on and they couldn't hear each other. And, you know, like the chat feature is not the most natural thing for folks. They don't even use it in Zoom all the time. And so I wanted them to be able to call each other on the phone and just say, hey, so sorry, we're having a little bit of a technical difficulty. Let me figure out what's happening and, and we can connect that way. So, um, and most of them did. And I think that everybody found that really helpful. Um, and then the, so just a couple other things, I guess. So the last major thing that I did was I just used Excel um, the same way I did for training, but this is the list. I just made a list of, Every single person who was participating, I just wrote their name here um, and I had a, a column off to the side of um, my interviewers uh, before I got accustomed to who everybody was just so I had that list to pull from. And I just color coded everything. Everyone, every, all the text was in black until there was a status to assign. So um, everybody is green once it's assigned. Um, uh, 
I turned it purple once it was completed. Some people, if they postponed or something else happened, um, I had to, I ended up with some other colors on my on my sheet as I've gone on. But it was basically just to keep track, so it was easy for me as I looked at it to be like, uh oh, there's a there's a purple or there's a red. Something something's uh, happening here. It's not just the standard green as I went through or the purple. So I wanted to make sure that um, I didn't miss anybody on the list. If they, you know, if I'd accidentally skip somebody, uh, that was important to me. So these color codes helped a lot with that. Um, and this VIP category is an interesting one. I think in-house, we probably all do this to some extent. Um, we like our community to feel as though they're all VIPs, obviously. I don't mean to say that with any kind of condescension, but they are all important to us, but there are some that need to be handled with more care. Um, and so I wanted to make sure that they were paired with um, the best interviewer for that situation. So these were, these were my templates and processes. Again, super simple, all Word, all Excel, um, and just lots and lots of copying and pasting. This is uh, incredible. Uh, yeah. And I see, let me see, I just want to double check. Uh, perfect. Okay. I was looking at the chat uh, real quick. Um, no, I mean, this, this is absolutely amazing, kind of the, the thoughtfulness and um, how you streamlined the, the process, because um, it's uh, a lot that has to be organized when you have, how many, how many interviewers do you ultimately, ultimately have? I think you 35. said like 30, 35. Yeah, right. I mean, that's incredible. Um, so, I, I mean, I'm curious to, uh, to get your thoughts in terms of what, what you saw as, uh, you know, could this have been possible with Zoom? I mean, what, what to you was the value of, of their story for uh, this particular um, project and, and process? Yeah, um, I honestly don't think we could have done this project without their story. Uh, so in terms of video recording, Zoom offers us that, easy peasy. Um, it's really not that difficult to use. Um, but you know, this, uh, we didn't, I, I also, uh, sorry, let me just start over a little bit. At the beginning of this project, I really didn't um, have a sense of the scale, right, that we were going to be working on. So uh, to do one interview a week on Zoom would have been no problem, but that's not how it worked out for us. And as we all know, um, like, I, well, okay. So the, the, a major feature of their story is that everything is centralized. It's all localized in one place. So everybody logs into the same platform, launches a session from the same platform. As soon as the interview is done, it's all saved and um, logged in one platform. And with Zoom, that's just not, it doesn't work that way, right? So um, we, I couldn't give all of those volunteers access to our Zoom account and you can't have multiple sessions recording and you know multiple hosts going on at one time on Zoom, at least not at our uh, account level. So the fact that if we had wanted to, all 35 of us could have been recording an interview at the same time um, in their story was really helpful. And no, you know, there's there's no lag, it doesn't slow down. Uh, so that that's a huge boon uh, without a doubt. And um, that localized piece is also huge. So Zoom, it's again, with the recording, it either records to your computer or you record it to the cloud. Super easy. Uh, just another step for my volunteers to have to make sure they got right and to be concerned about and worry about. Um, and I didn't want that to be an issue. I also didn't want people to choose to save it to their computer and then have to go through the process of uploading that or downloading it in some way, getting that to me via WeTransfer, Google Doc. There's just like so many more steps that would have been involved, um, which again, in hindsight, I don't know that it would have been that big of a deal if we were doing one or so interviews a week, but um, based on the scale at which we started um, working with this project, there's no way <laughs> looking back that I could have done it without their story. Um, and having all of the information right there too. So with Zoom, you also can't title it the way that you can title it. That's basically about it. You can't include the participants, any number of them. You can't um, include that description as easily, all the tags, publish it to groups, make sure that everybody can access it when they want to and when they need to. Um, yeah, so that that's a huge, a huge, huge part of Zoom. Um, or excuse me, of their story. Sorry, Zach. Uh, and then the <laughs> the other major thing with their story, and again, at the very beginning of this project, I might not have known that this would be su such a huge help, um, is Zach uh, and his team, right? So with Zoom um, or any other platform that you use, 
you there's always some sort of help desk. It might be live chat. It might just be you have to email or give them a call. Uh, and who knows when they might get back to you. So obviously that's all come a long ways uh, in the past year. So it's not that difficult, but it's not as easy as just being able to get right on a call with Zach, either on the phone, Slack, their story, whatever it was and say, uh, hey dude, <laughs> so like something's not working and I am completely at a loss. Like my interviewer has called me. I've worked through every single troubleshooting piece that I know how to do to make their audio work or to make each other hear each other and I can't do it. So um, are you free? And he almost always was. I think I remember two times where he was like, oh no, two minutes, I can't, you know. Um, and he, so that, that piece of their story is invaluable. And um, I've talked to Zach a lot. I don't see that going away. So in like, I couldn't recommend um, their story highly enough for that feature alone. Everything else you could work with, right? Every, all of us can make do with other systems, but that, um, that sort of hands-on help at any time you need it. And the, they've got all the knowledge, you know, they're not just working through a, um, a manual that's at their desk uh, is really, really, really helpful. Um, so yeah, I, I think those are the two major things there you know, um, yeah, I, we couldn't have done this project without their story. There's no way. Well, I'm glad to, to, uh, to hear that. And it's been such a pleasure working with you and yeah, really excited to continue, uh, to do so. Uh, I see, um, another question from, uh, from Jenny Matz, and then I have some more questions for you. Uh, and so, uh, just so everyone knows, we ha we've blocked off an, an hour and a half, so we'll continue a little bit. Um, I know an hour and a half can potentially be long for some folks, but I think it was on the uh, registration page. So we'll, we'll continue with some more kind of lessons learned, comparing remote interviewing to in-person, all, all this sort of stuff. Um, so stick around if you have time, but also we, we understand if some folks have to hop off at the hour, that's okay too. And we'll, we'll, uh, we'll continue uh, recording. Um, but so uh, Jenny had asked, for, for any interview, whether discussing a traumatic topic or just during the highly charged times we are living through, do you have any suggestions to mentally prepare the interviewer and interviewee? Is that part of training? Yeah, so in our core project, um, it is something that we talk about. Uh, you know, we, we can't, we know a lot about our community members. Uh, and so when they're on that list to be interviewed, we know if they've lost a partner, if they've had some other sort of big life event that needs to be handled with care. Um, and we go over that with the interviewers, you know, in terms of training folks how to handle that, it is not a huge, it's not a, it's not a focus for us because it's pretty difficult. We're not, that's not our expertise. We aren't trained ourselves in um, how best to handle traumatic stories, traumatic events, um, and COVID is no different. You know, we've had a few people who, um, we all knew when we met at, with my interviewers, we all talked about every one of us was going through the same thing that our interviewees were going to be going through, right? So in our core project, I might be interviewing someone who's in, in their 80s or 90s. They've had so much more life experience than I have, and I can't possibly relate to much of what they're talking about. With these interviews, um, it is different because every single one of us was going through exactly the same thing every day uh, in different ways, you know, but we had all dealt with um, the pain and the loss and the depression and the the trauma of the whole year um, in not just the pandemic, but the election and the so much fear. Um, and so I think that um, I'm not sure that the right way to say it is, you know, we're lucky, uh, but that our interviewers, because they had that experience, I think they were already pretty sensitive to um, what it might be like to hear that from other people as well. Um, and you know, um, I've listened to a lot of the interviews at this point, and some of them did have um, difficult discussions. People lost partners because of COVID or not. You know, they lost partners and they couldn't have their family with them because of COVID. So they didn't get to have a service. They didn't get to say goodbye the way they wanted to. People couldn't be with their families on their deathbed. And a lot of, a lot of sadness, a lot of tragedy. Um, and um, my interviewers were all very there's so much compassion and so much empathy and also so much joy that, that the, for the interviewees themselves to be able to share that because it hasn't been easy this year not to be able to see their friends and have that support. And for the interviewers to hear that, yeah, we're all in this together. I know we hear that all the time. Uh, we've heard that so much in 2020, but um, so I'm not sure that answered your question well. We don't, we don't train for that the way that um, somebody better equipped to talk about trauma might, but that's the best that we've done. 
Thanks, Alicia. And I see too in the chat, um, uh, uh, Stephen uh, Seeloff at Baylor just posted a link. Uh, definitely check this out. Uh, OHA's remote interviewing resources page um, has a dedicated bibliography for interviewing during the times of crisis with a link. So I'm going to grab that link, save this link, and we'll send it to everyone as well uh, in the follow-up, but definitely uh, be sure to, uh, to take a look. Um, there are a few uh, uh, questions on their story stuff. Um, do you mind if I uh, answer those real quick, Alicia? And then I want to ask about impact uh, for OJMCHE of, of doing the, uh, the project. Um, uh, so I'll, I'll try to keep it short because I want to make sure that this is as much about uh, the work uh, and impact for, uh, for you guys. Is, it, is that okay with you? Absolutely. Okay. Um, so Nick uh, has a question here. Uh, is, it, is it possible to keep the platform slash collective or collection private until a certain time or is it default slash automatically public? Uh, so, uh, I'm sorry, uh, this was Nikki. Um, and uh, so, yeah, so all recordings are private by default on their story. There's actually no public side to their story. Uh, you sign up with your own organizational code and then your interviewers uh, create an account that is specifically associated with your organization. The way to then make anything public or, or shareable, if you want, is to actually download it out of, uh, out of their story. Um, we also have an integration with two other platforms, uh, one for preservation, one for access, and over time we'll integrate with more. Um, and for preservation, that's permanent.org, um, which is the uh, first, uh, as far as, uh, as I know, and as they, as they say on, on, uh, on their site, the first uh, secure cloud storage platform that is backed by a nonprofit. Um, they have a, uh, a really great model around sustainability as opposed to like a Dropbox or something like that. Um, that is subscription based. Uh, it's a one-time fee, ten dollars per gigabyte, uh, and then store in, in perpetuity. Um, and uh, but they also have a, a grant program for nonprofits to provide free storage. So a number of uh, our partners like OJM, CHE, take advantage of the integration with Permanent, where you can actually preserve the recordings as you go, uh, and it's free for uh, uh, for nonprofits um, in kind of a tiered uh, uh, structure. Um, and then we integrate with Aviary uh, for, uh, for Access, which is a platform that was originally developed for Yale's Fortune Off video archive for Holocaust testimonies um, uh, around uh, accessibility and navigability of audiovisual uh, resources. And um, uh, so again, our, our, our goal, kind of like how Alicia had said for the volunteers, she didn't want them to have to think about downloading, re-uploading, anything like that. Uh, it's our goal to, you know, no downloads. Uh, you can just sync directly to permanent, sync directly to aviary, and through aviary or other systems that you may use, that's where you can kind of make those things um, uh, public uh, or shared with specific groups. Um, another, uh, along the lines of the, of the private aspect, I do want to mention one thing, which is that their story claims no ownership over any content that's collected through or uploaded to their story. So to answer um, Anne's question around, um, uh, can you drop a pre-recorded Zoom interview into the app? Yes, you absolutely can. You can upload uh, video or audio um, in multiple different formats, uh, MP3, uh, M4A, WAVE, um, .mov, you know, MP4, whatever you got, um, uh, for the most part, FLAC uh, as well. Uh, we support your uploading, then you can use their story for transcription. Uh, and uh, uh, indexing uh, coming quite uh, soon. Um, so those, I think, are a couple of the things that uh, I saw in the chat as it relates to, uh, uh, to their story. Um, so let me maybe stop on the their story piece for, uh, for a second. Um, but of course, feel free to, uh, to ask other questions uh, as you see it. But uh, talk a little bit, Alicia, if you would, about just the impact of this project um, for you, for the OJM CHE community, volunteers, what, what was the impact? Yeah, um, that's a great question. Um, I think it's been pretty big, actually. Um, for me, myself, it's been, it, I mean, <laughs> it's been a lot of work uh, without a doubt, but it's been such a pleasure, such a joy. So one of my 
a, again, a part of working in a community archive is working with lots and lots of volunteers and interns. So on a daily basis, you know, on a on a heavy day at the museum, I'd had five or seven volunteers in there at one time. And it's been really hard in COVID times not to have that. So getting to work with a project like this where I got to work so closely with volunteers again was really special, just really nice. Um, and I, of, of all the folks that signed up, I knew, um, a handful, you know, so now having also gotten to know so many others um, that and we've kept up personal correspondence outside of just the project, which has been also really nice just to build those relationships. I think that's also been really special for my volunteers. Um, some of them, uh, <clears throat> I can't remember if I mentioned this earlier, I apologize if I ha if I did, but um, you know, I would pair up a, a an interviewer with an interviewee, and I had no idea who knew who, if at all. And sometimes she'd respond, one of them would respond to me and say, Oh my God, I, I know her. We, our kids went to school together. It's been 15 years since I talked to her, but we saw each other every day, you know, while our kids were in school. And like, it'll, it'll be so great to reconnect with this person. And um, like, that's been really special just to sort of get to witness those connections. Um, I, yeah, I, I think connections are a really big part for me, obviously. I also think in terms of the museum, um, you know, it's, it's, it's added, 200 plus stories to our collection. And it's it's built for us um, an archive of what it meant to be Jewish and live through 2020 and the pandemic. So something that, um, that was part of KJM's call to us and something that we were really interested in as well um, was at least for us in our community. So when the pandemic first hit, you know, we were all going through, um, all of our synagogues had to, had to pivot to, right? So um, Passover changed, Purim changed, um, all of these events that they'd had planned had to change and that includes the high holidays. So um, most of our rabbis who were preparing their sermons were asking us if we had anything in the collection related to the 1918 pandemic, right? Um, so we looked and we looked and we looked and we have some diaries and lots of correspondence and meeting minutes and, and things from synagogues and organizations dating before 1918. You know, we looked from 1916 all the way through 1920 and not a single mention, not one in our collection um, that was of use. So, uh, and what we discovered really was people didn't want to talk about it at the time. Like a um, recording those stories was different than it is now, but it was something people wanted to get past and forget. And while that may be true for many people of 2020 as well, we didn't want that to happen. If people were willing to share their story, we wanted to collect that story. And so I think for us as an institution to have this piece of history in our collection is, is huge. Um, and it's just, you know, again, the connections. So many people who weren't aware of our work before or knew we existed, but hadn't really participated in events or programs um, know now you know, that we're here. And that's been a huge, a huge deal for us too. We've had more requests for um, a, a different ones of us to do presentations or to give a talk to this group about what we collect and, you know, oh my gosh, we didn't know you guys were there. And that's been really huge for us. I think that impact can't be overstated enough. Yeah, it's incredible. Kind of the, the relationships, the, the awareness, the um, just engagement with, with the community. Um, yeah, no, that, that's incredible. I, uh, I want to jump back to uh, uh, Krista and Susan had two comments earlier about managing volunteers that I want to jump back to and also just call out real quick uh, a comment from Amanda that, um, around impact. You know, the, the intergenerational conversation element of oral history is such a huge element for positive social change and community building. And Yeah, I agree. Well, well said, 100%. Yeah. Love mm -hmm. it. Um, so uh, Krista and, uh, and Susan had some questions before. So Krista, uh, I'd love to hear more about the structure of your volu volunteer program. How are they trained, supervised? What does quality control uh, look like? I think maybe that is something that we haven't uh, addressed since uh, Krista's earlier uh, question. Uh, what have you found is the sweet spot in terms of number of volunteers doing work and staff members supervising? Um, if she's still listening, I wonder if it's possible for her to clarify. And she mean specifically with the oral history project or the collections in general, because, uh, you know, there, I can talk about both or just one. Um, I guess I can talk about, um, it's, it's all a little bit the same, I guess. So I'll just start with the oral history program because that's what we're talking about currently. So um, the- And that's what Krista qualified to. Great. Um, so it's, yeah, so- uh, the training is the way that we, you know, 
structure our volunteer program, I guess, so that they're trained. Um, we put out a call every once in a while. We're asking for volunteers um, to conduct oral history specifically. Um, and we, just like I did uh, for this project, we just send out an email, ask people to confirm a time or more that works for them so we can get them into the museum. And we really walk through the whole process. You know, what is, what's the purpose of oral history? Why are we concerned with it? Um, what value does it bring to our collection? And then the bulk of that training is really how to conduct an oral history, um, which is more than we can talk about here. But again, I can send you those documents as well if you'd like just how we train our volunteers, the sorts of questions we suggest and the ones we discourage. You know, open-ended questions can be good at times, but they're challenging. You know, if you say, tell me what it was like growing up in Portland. That's a little broad. It's a little hard for people to answer that question. Like, where do I start? So we really recommend, for example, you ask, um, tell me, Tell me about the school you went to um, as a child and tell me about what those relationships were like. Tell me who grew up in your household with you, you know, really like pretty specific questions. Um, supervision is, you know, we depend on our volunteers to be somewhat uh, self-starting. So we, um, uh, you know, we give them a call. We say, so we have this person who, want, who wants or needs to be interviewed. Um, do you have time? Is this someone that you could take on? And then we leave it in their hands to make that phone call or send that email and make the schedule on their own. And whether they, then they need to come into us to get the recorder. We do use all of, um, all the recorders we use are in-house. Um, and so they do have to come pick those up and it's, we're there. So they just have to say, hey, I'll be in later this afternoon and pick it up. And that's fine. Um, we don't micromanage. We don't overmanage. Um, we do, Part of supervision to me at least and part of training is to um, review all of the work that they do as they're getting their feet wet. So I want to make sure that um, I listen to at least spot check those interviews and if I feel like something might maybe there's some advice I could give them that could help it go smoother than I do. Um, and, uh, you know, I think that that's a piece that most of them really welcome. They really want to, um, they really want to have some guidance. They want to do it well, you know. Um, and in terms of quality control, uh, that we really depend on our waivers and our, our, um, you know, the discretion of our interviewers to keep things um, to themselves, especially that their inter that their narrator has asked for. These are public stories. We we make sure that everyone who's participating knows that we're going to use these stories in our collection. They're going to be available for research, um, for use in our exhibits, use in our programming probably uploaded up to the website, um, used in social media. We do have people who uh, ask that we don't use their interview or pieces of their interview in certain areas, but otherwise give us full use of that story. Um, so unless they say, oh man, I, I, you know, I, I said this thing about my friend or this rabbi or that person, and I really shouldn't have said that in public. Can you please take that out? I'll take it out. Um, and then make sure to reiterate with the interviewer, hey, they, they weren't thrilled with the way that they responded to this. So if you just would keep that to yourself, that would be really um, appreciated. And again, it's the honor system. I really depend on um, the people that we have working with us to, to honor that. Um, and sweet spot <laughs> in terms of staff to volunteers, there really isn't one. It really depends on what's on your plate. You know, sometimes I have two volunteers in and I'm like, oh my God, I, I can't focus. Like you guys have so many questions or you, I need to start you on two separate brand new projects. And that can be a lot of work. Other times I can have seven or 10 people in there and they're all doing their thing. And it's great. Um, in terms of this project, I will say managing 34 people with my own other job responsibilities and also participating in this project, um, is challenging that, that I don't recommend. I spent too many 12 hour days to count. Um, and, I'm young enough that it's fine, but um, I, it's hard still. And I don't recommend anybody, uh, you know, take that on. So the sweet spot question is a tough one. I think it really depends on your your workload otherwise um, and, how, and how some volunteers are easier to manage than others. There's just no way about it. Yeah, and um, uh, Krista has a follow-up question here. And Mary, I see yours as well. We'll, we'll come to yours next. Um, but Krista's follow-up question uh, she says, I I'm curious about the comment you made earlier about volunteer oral historians being harder to retain than people working on post-production slash interview processing. I've had the same experience. Any sense why? Yeah, so um, 
I, I really think it boils down to time commitment and nerves. So people come to us and they, they hear our oral histories. They, they see the work that we do. They read them, maybe a friend or family member of theirs has been interviewed and they're really excited about that concept, right? I think it's really excited to be, or easy to be excited about a thing before you really get involved with it. Um, and then once you come to that training and you sort of hear, it's a process, right? Like the getting in touch with someone you maybe don't know, meeting them at their house or the museum or a business or someplace that you don't know. And, you know, like, how do you start that conversation and asking the correct questions and making sure you capture all the right information and you get the recorder working correctly. Um, all of it, once you do it a couple of times is not complex or difficult, but that initial you know, sort of getting over that hurdle of like, whoa, that's a lot more than I thought it was, is challenging. Um, that's been something that we've heard uh, and that seems to be pretty obvious for us with the people that, that can't stay with the project. That time part is a big one too. Just, you know, like I said, we, the folks that we're interviewing and the folks who are doing the interviews all have schedules, whether they're flexible or not. And sometimes it's just difficult to connect people together. And as soon as one or two times might not work, or especially because they do have to work on our schedules in terms of shadowing, they need to be available when we are conducting an interview that they can shadow. And that is often the first hurdle is if they can't participate in a, in a shadow interview, we can't set them out there on their own, you know, um, in good faith, because our community depends on us to send people to them to conduct these interviews um, and do it well and capture their story accurately. And if, if we haven't gotten to see somebody do it and have them watch us do it, we, we just can't trust that that will happen. So um, it's that time commitment. And, and I think the hurdle of um, how many steps it really is to conduct it, the, the histories. And that's a challenge that we've yet to figure out how to address. We've changed our trainings here and there. We've, we've tried to break them up into pieces. Instead of asking people to make a separate time to shadow, we have started doing mock interviews in those sessions. So after we, we allot more time for the trainings and then afterwards we all join each other. And you know um, someone does a, a few questions with me. We sort of walk through that process and everybody gets to try on each other. And it's not fail safe and it doesn't mean that they're suddenly trained and going to be great, <laughs> but it's a it's a it's a step in the right direction um, in terms of getting people um, accustomed and just comfortable with the process. Um, I have two follow up questions here, but uh, looking at the time, I want to make sure I get to Mary's first. But before, I'm just going to put it out there so I don't forget. Which is uh, two things that I'm curious about. Don't answer. We're going to come back to it if we have time. Is what have been common traits about volunteer or oral uh, historians or volunteer uh, interviewers, uh, common traits of people who have stuck around uh, and anything that is not their traits, but traits about the program that you had at the time or, or things like that. You know, what, what are factors that have led to interviewers sticking around, whether about them or external to them? And two, I'm curious, although it's been a relatively short period, five to six months um, with their story so far, have you seen any differences in like excitement or retention of, uh, of interviewers? And, and I, don't, I don't know the answer to that, so I'm really curious, but let's come back to that in a second. Uh, so Mary's question is, um, two questions. Number one, uh, is this an ongoing project or has the interviewing portion been closed? Number two, was this a local level project, Oregon, uh, for example, uh, that was a part of a larger collection effort by Cajun uh, and, and she asked because uh, Mary, uh, hello from uh, uh, Vermont Folk Life Center, um, uh, asked because she's aware of communities in Vermont who might be interested in creating something similar. Mm -hmm. um, so um, it has been an ongoing project. We are continuing to conduct interviews through February and um, we will have a second phase of the project. We're just not quite sure what that looks like yet. So. Um, Theoretically, we're winding down that collecting portion. In terms of this project, in-house, we may continue to collect interviews of people who, who heard about the project late. Um, and this, our participation is local. This is our community specifically that we're capturing, but there, um, there are 10 institutions in this first phase. Um, I think that's correct, 10 of us. And so they're all over nine, the- Nine, I think. Nine, yeah, sorry. Numbers. So um, I know that we're all over the country. Um, so everybody's collecting within their communities or their regions. Um, I know some museums represent more than one state. We, we don't. Um, and so, uh, yeah, it is, um, it is a larger collecting effort on a national level, but we're all collecting within our communities specifically. Yeah, and this, uh, and this started as it was made possible by the Council of American Jewish Museums who sponsored 
uh, the overall project across the nine uh, institutions, uh, which is now going to be uh, expanding um, mm -hmm. uh, for the next year, which is very uh, exciting uh, and growing the number of institutions that are going to be doing this uh, effort of kind of the, the Jewish experience during uh, COVID. Um, awesome. So your first question you asked just a minute ago was comments yeah. in, in interviewers that we've been able to retain. Yeah. Yeah. Um, that's interesting. I think something that's been really of um, note, I guess, was especially with a few of the interviews who are participating now, but a lot of the people who, who stick around are people who have done interviewing before, whether in an oral history capacity like this or they worked in HR. You know, I have a lot of people who signed up for this project and they said, um, oh, it's, you know, I've, I've done so many interviews over the years uh, and I've asked them what their background is and they've, they've worked in management. So they, they have experience connecting with and interacting with people that they've never met before and that they have to draw information out of. And so that's a, that's a group that um, I would continue to sort of pull from. Not that it's actually that easy to find that, like to just be like, oh, hey, people who have worked in management in HR, do you want to participate in our oral history project? Um, I haven't really figured out how to put that kind of a call out there. Other common traits are people who are, um, and it's true, people sign up for this project and they are very shy and introverted, but they want to volunteer for an organization. They like our organization. And so they're, they want to put their effort out there, but they can't get past that shy piece. Um, the folks who stuck around the longest and the most are just charismatic um, or at simply like just fearless about talking to folks, which isn't an easy, it's, you can't train it, um, at least not easily. And a lot of us don't have that. It, it is challenging to, um, to it, you know, just to, to put yourself out there and ask questions that, you know, not to worry that they're dumb questions or bad questions or hard questions and just be present. Uh, and so that's a tough thing to train. And I'd say that the folks that we've been able to retain that theme is um, it's, it's the folks who have some experience interviewing already um, or just have an outgoing personality. And that's hard to find um, and hard to identify at times. Yeah. Yeah. So what, um, what are some kind of lessons learned from, from the experience and, uh, you know, things, if you were to start the project over, what would you do different? Uh, <laughs> I would make sure that there was one, maybe two other people who were either on staff or volunteers, uh, but, but that were helping to manage the project. Um, I loved every minute of it and it's been great, but you know, COVID has been challenging for all of us in different levels. Um, We've had a loss in our family. You know, we had to travel unexpectedly. I was doing this work while I was in a different time zone, working with my people here, which made things challenging. Um, and if I had had other, and I had, I had very, um, I, ha I have incredibly supportive colleagues um, and our director and, and my my colleague Anne. Like, there's, they will do anything for me and anything that I ask. But sometimes, because I didn't have those sort of systems in place. It was hard to just say, oh, how about, can you do this and you do this and I'll do this just to like offset that a little bit. So from the get go, having one to three hands working on a project like this, if you're, if you're shooting for the scope that we, that we aimed for, even though I thought 150 was ambitious, the fact that we plan to make 150, if you have that goal, <laughs> have other people that can help you manage the project, have one person who's dedicated to just responding to people when they have questions and someone who's dedicated to making those assignments and introductions, and then have someone else who's dedicated to the tech piece so that whenever somebody's having an issue with the way that the technology is working, that you're the person they call and the other people just go about their other tasks, right? So like um, a little bit more delegation is what I would have done um, looking back and, um, you know, other lessons learned um, is really trial by error, uh, without a doubt. I thought about at one point, gosh, it would be so easy to have a calendar that we all used so that I knew when people were conducting interviews. I'm in meetings all day. I conduct interviews and my phone rings and I can't help but look at it. I don't answer it. But if it's one of my interviewers, generally the only reason they're calling me is because they're having an issue conducting their own interview. And I want that to be taken care of as soon as possible. Um, and if I knew that they, like, if they could see that I was busy, then they could have a backup call. They'd have to like, can't like reschedule that interview and wait till I was available. But of course, 
it's hard enough for, for a staff to manage a collection or excuse me, a calendar sometimes 35 volunteers, making sure they all used it and updated it correctly. And, you know, that would have been challenging too. So, um, yeah, the lessons learned pieces <clears throat> for me, the biggest one is, is help. It's just having, having, um, other team members that are, that are there to not just support and offer anything, but that you as a project manager really set that up ahead of time. Um, and, and, and trust and depend on them and, and and really delegate, not just say, yeah, technically they're handling that piece, but you still do it all yourself anyway, so. Yeah, yeah. Um, curious, in terms of now having done a bunch of remote interviews yourself uh, and heard other people doing remote interviews or work with other people doing remote interviews uh, in a large number, what, what have you learned about best practices in remote interviewing and how it compares and contrasts to in-person oral histories and in interviews? Yeah, um, that's a great question. Um, best practices really follow uh, pretty closely to best practices and in in-person. Um, you still want to be, you know, like the the piece about being in person is you're sitting across the table from somebody and that 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 body language connection is there, the eye contact is there. I think something about doing remote interviews can't be done without video because it's so hard to we've done a couple over the phone, but that's very difficult. So finding a way to maintain that 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 um interperson connection. Um and to pay attention, right? Like I, as something that is best practice, which is true in an in-person interview too, and but as difficult to achieve is, is being a good listener, right? Um, so like really making sure <clears throat> that when they ask, when they give a response and you wanna ask a follow-up question, you say, so I, I heard you talking about X, Y, Z. Can you please elaborate by telling us about this? You know, like, I think that that's a, that's a huge piece. Um, none of that is necessarily different than, than in-person interviews. Best practices um, certainly have something to do with the technology choices that you make. Um, I think it's, it's impossible to do. Um, I saw somebody put in the chat, for example, that when you do an interview on Zoom, the thing that's really nice, as soon as it downloads, you have the video component and the audio component separate. So for us, that's handy because our transcription software uses the audio only and it's an MP3. So you can just save it, drop it right there. I extract it from these interviews if I want to do that, which is not difficult. It's fine. Um, but um, choosing the right software to conduct a remote project with is, is, uh, absolutely paramount. Uh, I think that you will make your life so much more difficult and run into more trouble and more hurdles than you need to if you choose a technology or try to piece some technologies together. So like I said, the fact that their story is not only the place where you can do the recording, but then the actual finished pro product is also right there. And then you can transcribe from right there. You can edit that transcription from right there. You can export it from right there. You can download, you can do everything right there as opposed to, okay, so we use Zoom to do the video recording and now it's saved either to the cloud or the desktop or server. And then we have to move it around in order to use it. Um, you know, or we have to make a list or we have to, you know, it's just not as it's, um, it's absolutely possible, but uh, I think that that's, that, that has to be part of that conversation um, in terms of remote projects like this is that software piece. Absolutely. And, and a quick plug uh, as well is uh, kind of the recent feature that we've, uh, just released around being able to automatically locally record each person's audio so that you actually get a smooth wave audio file track for each uh, participant uh, on the call. So you have both the MP4 that's archive quality, uh, 48 kilohertz, 16 bit, and then you also have the locally recorded audio for each participant uh, as well. So kind of getting all of those, those pieces. Um, cool. Any, anything else? We, we got three minutes. Uh, any, anything else that, that you would feel remiss to uh, you know, not to share before we wrap? I don't think so. I think we've covered everything um, that I can think of. I'm sure there's something I missed. I really hope um, everybody reaches out if they have uh, any questions. Um, I know I saw quite a few going through in the chat and Zach and, and, and um, Amber have uh, made sure to make a note. So I'll send out all of that documentation to anybody who, who requested it. Um, and anything else people are interested in that I didn't share. So the PowerPoint that I 
put together with the checklist for folks to work from. I did record one of the trainings um, so you could just see sort of how that process worked. Uh, anything else that people would like to, to have or see or have access to, please just um, don't hesitate to let me know. I'm happy to share. Awesome. Alicia, pleasure as always. Thank you so much. Thanks everyone for, for joining. Um, can't wait for the next time and I'm sure I'll see you on Slack uh, probably later today. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely, without a doubt. <laughs> right, yeah, awesome. thank you everyone for coming and thanks a lot, Zach. I'll talk to you soon. Thank you. Okay. Bye. Bye.